<clears throat> Hello. Sorry, just clearing my throat. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Into the Sideways World, Ross Welford, chapters 22 and 23 tonight. Are you ready? Here we go. A bit later, Jacob, the social worker from Winston Churchill House, turns up in a car to collect Manny, who's been very quiet, hunched over his warm milk on the sofa, saying absolutely nothing. He leaves quietly too, muttering, thank you. He's following Jacob to the car when he turns to me. He can't say much, but his green eyes meet mine and he says, It really happened, yeah? Yeah. Jacob hears us. Too right, it flaming happened. <laughs> Honestly, man, you won't believe the number of forms I'm going to have to fill in. Get in car. Oh, and by the way, I don't suppose you know anything about my camera, do you? <laughs> I give Manny a sympathetic smile and close the door. From inside comes the sound of a hissy fight between mum and dad. I only went to the pub to get some peace and quiet. Don't you start, Ted. How can you go to the pub when the state of the accounts are in? It was beyond me. I hate hearing them rowing. I sometimes wish they would shout at each other, but they seldom do. It's always hushed voices and snapped comments. Poor Alex looks like he's been dipped in a huge bucket of sadness. I assume she's been hissed at because she was meant to be looking after me. I can't stand it. By the time Mum and Dad come back into the lounge, I've decided I'm going to tell them everything. And I mean everything. It can't make things worse, can it? Maudie has this framed picture on her workshop wall that says, Three things cannot be long hidden. The sun, the moon and the truth. So I think of that and I say, Mum, Dad, I need to explain and I tell them the truth about Manny and the cog, then the cave. I tell them about waking up in my room and how everything in the new world is the same but slightly different. The flying cigars, the free rides, the Fry Academy. And they don't fight wars either, I say. They've devoted human ingenuity to solving problems rather than creating them. Surely that's wonderful, isn't it? They're looking at me pityingly. See, I say holding up my inked on arm. This was the code that Manny used to operate the free rides. He wrote it on my arm. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I can't stop yawning. He wrote it on my arm so I wouldn't forget it. I can see the glances going on between them. Obviously, Manny or I would have written this stuff on my hand anywhere, anytime. Still, I'm pleased when Alex leans over for a closer look. She stares at the writing for a while and then just, ju and then just says, <laughs> Just that. <laughs> which doesn't give anything away, but sounds exactly like the other Alex, the boy Alex. My clothes, I say. That lime green hoodie. I didn't have that before. Even as I say it, I know they're thinking I could have got it from anywhere. Probably Manny is his sort of thing to wear, after all. And then I tell him about school and the bluer than blue sea and how Dean and Malik were suddenly not mean anymore and the cog eating a banana and the world without war about me and Manny's trip back to the cave. There's one thing I don't mention, the one thing that I can't find the words to say until I've finished everything else. Then I sort of blurt it out. And I met my brother, I say. I tell you, talk about the change in atmosphere. Till that moment, everyone had been looking at me with confusion, but in a kind of warm, gentle way, and I realised what it was. They were all pretending to believe me. You know, let Willa say what she needs to say and we won't judge her. That way she'll calm down and we might uncover the truth, which quite obviously is that bad lad Manny lured her into a cave on some crazy danger there. And then I go and mention Boy Alex, and it's like someone has opened a window and a cold breeze has swelled in. First mum's then dad's and then alex's eyes drift to the mantelpiece in a little little silver framed photo of baby alexander they start to talk at once willa love says dad with a sad tone what are you on about sneers alex i met him he was alive a teenager like he should have been by now i think you've said enough willa says mum coldly that's quite a cruel thing to make up i'm not making it up it's the truth i'm about to add I also met Grandad Norman, but I stopped myself just in time. It would just make things worse. I can see from their faces that they're not going to believe me. What I have done, so far as my family is concerned, is something recklessly dangerous with, that, with a new kid from school requiring a rescue by the lifeboat crew. Then, to cover my tracks, I've made up a stupid lie about a whole day in another world like some baby four-year-old. Honestly, it's beginning to sound even untrue to me. Still, before I dissolve into more sobs, I tell them what Mordy told me. The truth is the truth, whether or not you choose to believe it. Okay. 
It's been a day now. I've hardly been out. It's Monday and mum and dad have asked... Been a- <laughs> Let me try again. It's Monday and mum and dad have asked school to give me some time off to cope with the trauma of being in a supposed life or death rescue. But I know what's really going on. It's the delusion thing. No one believes me. I'm being given time to come to my senses before going back to school. Otherwise, my story's going to be ripped apart by the likes of Dina Malik. Manny and I will be mocked mercilessly and the school will have a major bullying incident on its hands. All right, truth be told, because the truth is becoming increasingly important here, I didn't arrive at that conclusion completely alone. It's what Alex told me for my own good. I don't want to be mean or anything, she began. This, in my experience, is always a lead into someone being mean. But you better not say that sort of, any of that steaming pile of lies outside these four walls. You might not care what people think of you, but I care about what people think of me. I'm pretty sure Finley McQueen is about to ask me out. And if my little sister's going around with tales of flying cars and magical caves or whatever it is, it won't reflect well on me. You're 12, for heaven's sakes, not six. Trouble is... I can see her point. Meanwhile, the text messages from Manny have been pinging all day. Bing! We're not mad, are we, Willa? It all really happened. Bing! Yes, it definitely did. They just think we're lying little kids. Bing! You're lucky. Jacob thinks there's a sign of something serious, and because of me, Mum, he wants me to take me to a psychiatrist, but they're pretending it's just a regular doctor for a checkup. I would come round, but I'm not allowed out. Manny's spelling is bad, and the automatic spell check doesn't always spot it. I reply... Not a good idea anyway. My parents blame you for taking me into the cave. Bing! They're right. I did. At least he's honest. A few moments later, my phone goes again. Bing! We'll back each other up, yeah? Bing! Straight away, I reply. Totally. I've tried to talk to Mum and Dad and Alex about what happened. I've tried to sound as calm and as reasonable as I can, but they won't have it. Mum keeps telling me that I'll feel better if I just admit that I was led astray. Dad keeps saying I won't need to cover for Manny. Nana and Gramps are supposed to be driving up from Leeds tomorrow. After dinner, Mum says to me, Willa, do me a favour. Don't mention the stuff about, you know, what you say happened to your Nana. She'll just worry. That's when I snap, like a rubber band that's been stretched and stretched. Do you mean the thing that actually happened? Mum sighs. Don't sigh like that. Don't sigh like that, Mum. I sob, and yet again I say, I'm telling you the truth. I get to my feet, and I stride over to the mantelpiece, picking up the picture of baby Alexander. It's this, isn't it? You can't bear the fact that I've seen him, that I know he's alive somewhere else. You're jealous. There's a beat of silence. Then, as Mum sinks onto the sofa, her face crumples. Dad has heard this and storms in from his study. Willa, that's enough of that. You are being cruel, and the time to give up this ridiculous story is right now. Do you understand? We stand facing each other, both of our chests heaving with emotion. He presses his lips together into a thin white line, closes his eyes, and takes a deep breath to calm himself. With a lowered, deliberately calm voice, he says... I think you should apologise to your mum. We're all under enough stress with this Happy Land business and you nearly drowning without adding more. I look over at where she sits, her chin wobbling and her eyes moist. I immediately regret being so harsh. I don't think anyone likes making their mum cry, but still I wonder, how can the truth hurt so much? I sit next to her and I hug her. Sorry mum. I say. She sniffs and hugs me back. I know, pet. Things have been tough for you, she says, and she kisses the top of my head. It's all that talk of baby Alexander, you know. If I could believe it were true, it would be all right. I honestly think that if it were true, then I'd like it, you know. It would be nice and comforting to know that my poor baby lived on some another world or something, but pretending, that doesn't help at all, will it? Not at all. She gives me a final squeeze and I know what the squeeze means. I don't want to hear any more about it. Still, an idea has begun to form in my head. A thin wisp of smoke arises over Maudie's high hedge, a sure sign that her fire's going, and that usually means hot chocolate. Got someone special today, says Maudie without turning round. I suddenly remember the last time I greeted her by poking her in the bum and for a split second I wonder if it's really her, but I needn't have worried. She's standing over a pan of milk in her open-fronted shed. Just received a delivery. 80% organic Ecuadorian. Might be a little on the bitter side for you, my love, but we'll add some sugar if you like. She breaks a few pieces into the milk, moves the pan nearer to the flame and hands me the wooden whisk. Before I can even say anything, she says, 
That's a heck of an adventure you've had, Willa. You and that wee fella you were with, it's... I stop whisking. So you know about it? Maudie folds her arms under her boobs and hoists them up. Oh, aye, your dad mentioned it when we were fixing that faulty boiler this morning. It was pretty clear to me that he didn't have much time for your story, but I only got it second hand. Thought I might like to hear it first hand myself, you know, get the eyewitness account. You might want to watch that milk there, Willa. Don't want to burn it. I pull the pan away from the flames and give it another whisk. The rich aroma of chocolate mixes with the wood smoke. I pour two frothy mugs and then settle down onto my usual cushion-covered crate with Aristotle wrapping himself around my ankles. I tell Maudie the same thing I've told everyone else, while stroking the cat and sipping my drink. Unlike everyone else, Maudie doesn't interrupt, not once. She just sits there, drinking her hot chocolate, letting me take as long as I like, and pause and correct myself if I've said something wrong, and she nods and listens and takes everything in as if she has all the time in the world. When I get to the bit about the world without war, her white eyebrows lift slowly above the rim of her glasses, but still she doesn't say anything. And now everyone thinks I'm mad, suffering from delusions, or just lying for fun, I don't know. And I'm crazy for going there in the first place, and they blame Manny for leading me astray. Maudie drains her cup with a satisfied slurp. She gets to her feet. Are you coming then? Where are they going to go? I don't know. Do you... I don't know, like we're now on chapter 24, look. Do you reckon that Maudie has been there before? Do you reckon that's where she's now about to take Willa? Or is she going to take her somewhere else? I don't know. I don't know. Let's find out next time, shall we? And hopefully, in the next instalment of our story, there won't be as much yawning going on. <laughs> I do apologise for that. It's the weekend. <laughs>